Hi, this is Pastor Bob. Welcome today to Student of the Word. This is our last in the series on the healing lamb. And I'm going to talk to you today about the compassion that Jesus had his love toward people. We often get so wrapped up in the fact that demons are subject to us and we rejoice in that that we forget the greatest thing is not the fact the demon is gone. The person has been set free. Jesus came with love and compassion above power to cast out devils. You need to have the same thing. I rejoice in a person's healing. I rejoice because a person is now been set free. Let's go to the Word of God together. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. And today is the final day I'll be teaching on the healing lamb. We've been taking up the healing ministry of Jesus. We've been taking up healing scriptures, fulfillment of scriptures. And then we actually talked about what Jesus did for us. In his redemption on the cross, he not only took care of sin on the cross, he also took care of sickness and disease. Quoted the scriptures from Isaiah chapter 53 about the fact that he took our sin to the cross, but he also took our infirmities and our sicknesses, and by his stripes we were healed. Wonderful, wonderful passage of scripture, Old and New Testament. Again, the fact that Jesus was anointed by God to heal sickness and disease, and now has passed that on to us, has given us that authority, and part of our witness is to take the healing message of the Lord Jesus Christ to those who are sick. In fact, many times when Jesus ministered to the multitudes, it said he healed all their sick of every disease. And then the following verses said, and many believed on him. And what this is pointing out is the fact that really healing is part of our witness to the world and the power we have in witnessing. It's to be used in witnessing and is part of the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, cast out devils. There is a supernatural side to witnessing, not just the words we use from our mouth, not just our testimony, our personal testimony, but also if we run across a person who is sick, lay hands on them. And I can tell you this, after they are healed, they're going to think twice about, wait a minute, this God that just healed me of something that I couldn't heal myself might actually be able to save me from something I can't save myself. And they'll receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. So again, it's a great witnessing tool. And I think it's been interesting through the years how the denominations have always pointed out that missions activities around the world, that the nations that seem to be more open to the gospel, they have greater uh, numbers of salvation, are when charismatics, Pentecostals come in, and they come in with healing as well as the preaching of the gospel because the two go hand in hand. And so they comment on that because many denominations who don't believe in being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking with tongues come against it, but that one thing they'll have to say for these people that come in here and teach speaking with tongues, and the supernatural, they sure get a lot of people saved. Well, again, that's the purpose of it. And not only did Jesus have it in his ministry, but gave it to us on the day of Pentecost, and then the day after that, whenever uh, the first one, chapter two, Peter preached this incredible sermon. But by the time we come to chapter three, chapter four, we have signs and wonders and miracles. The man at the gate, beautiful, was healed. And then he went walking, leaping, praising God, followed them into the temple. It's what happens. We get them saved on the street by the power of God. We have signs and wonders on the streets. And then they follow us to church. That's the way it should be because that's where the main area of raising a person into a disciple comes is by bringing them to church. Well, let's talk about this today. We've talked about the healing power of God. In the past couple of lessons, I've been talking about your authority to lay hands on the sick and see them recover, and then also casting out devils. But I want you to note something. Whenever we do lay hands on a sick person, there's two things involved. Number one, there is a person that we're laying hands on. And number two is there's a sickness, a disease, or a demon that we are addressing. And this is the love-hate relationship. You say, what do you mean a love-hate relationship? Not only do we hate the works of the devil, but we must also love the people we are sent to. Don't let that anger come out of us onto them because they're not the one we're angry with. In fact, we're going out there because we love them. So today I'm gonna talk about what works with your authority is also a compassion for people. Jesus had this also. Look at Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 14. And we find out this all comes from the word of God. The word of God teaches us the love side and the hate side. So you say, well, are we supposed to hate as Christians? Yeah, I hate the works of the devil. 
despise them. I mean, I hate it when I watch the news and see the works of Satan going on. It just makes me more angry at him. And I actually think there's going to come a day when you're going to be cast into hell for a thousand years. And after that, the lake of fire forever and forever. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, where there is no counsel, the people fall, but in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. Counsel is not only me to you, but also from the word of God. And in a multitude of counselors, I like to think of it this way, where there is no scripture and study of scripture and applying scripture, the people fall, but in a multitude of scriptures, there's safety. In fact, in uh, Psalms, 119, where all the different names for the word of God are given, we find that that your testimonies are my counselors in Psalm 119, verse 24. So when I say you need counsel, I don't mean you need to go find yourself a counselor, although there's nothing wrong with that if they apply the word of God, but also go look up a multitude of scriptures on the subject that you're dealing with. Before you go witness to somebody, lay hands on the sick, why don't you go and get a multitude of, of counselors? Get testimonies with you from the word of God and the word of God will give you different uh, areas of to way to look at uh, ministering to the sick and ministering to the demon possessed, ministering to those who are confused, all the different things we have. Matthew chapter 12, verses one through eight tells us about this. Jesus went out to minister and his attitude toward sickness was one side, but also his attitude toward the people were the other. In this particular case, Jesus talks about religion and religion's attitude attitude toward those that come with a need and toward the need itself. And so here in chapter 12, verses one through eight, let's go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, it says at that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn. They walking through a cornfield on the Sabbath day. Notice this, and his disciples were hungry and began to pick the ears of corn and eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, behold, your disciples do what is not lawful on the Sabbath day. My first question is, if Jesus was walking through a cornfield, where were the Pharisees? They had to be hiding in the corn. Can you imagine picking an ear of corn? Suddenly these heads start popping up out of the cornfield. They start pointing the finger at Jesus. They've been waiting on him to do something that they could get onto him for. And you know what? It didn't work this time like it didn't work any other time. I'm just surprised here. Jesus and his disciples must look at each other and start laughing. It's gone to the point now they're having to hide among corn just to catch us doing something they don't like. But he said to them, haven't you read what David did? When he was hungry and those who were with him, uh, how he entered into the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat or those with him only for the priest. What he's saying here, this story out of 1 Samuel chapter 21 tells about whenever that David was running from King Saul, he came here to this city and where the priests were and he went into where the showbread was, he just picked it up and he ate it. And this was not lawful for him to do, but you know what? It, by the word of God and by the law of the Lord, it didn't say here that the person couldn't eat the showbread. When you're extremely hungry, it was all right to go do this because the personal needs of people come above the law of the Old Testament. In other words, there's never a scripture written that you can't eat corn out of a cornfield on the Sabbath day. It does say you're not supposed to harvest. Harvest is work, but your cornfield is open to anyone walking through it that if they're really hungry, they can grab an ear of corn. Now, it says in verse five, and Jesus says, or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath day, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and they're blameless. This is a quote from Malachi chapter one, verses six through eight. And the story is there how that even the priests were uh, doing this and they were considered to be blameless. If the priests can do this, then why can't just the average person do it? But I say to you in this place is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. The son of man is Lord, even of the Sabbath day. What's this verse saying here? It's simply saying that these men, these Pharisees put people down on the list and they put the law above them. Jesus didn't break a law from the word of God. He broke a tradition which had been added by the Pharisees. Jesus has been said in many cases, broke the law because he had already kept the law. He had already come to fulfill the law so he could break it. No, he couldn't break the law. Whenever he was hanging on the cross, he said, Father, it has been fulfilled. What he was speaking about, every jot, every tittle of the Old Testament had been fulfilled. 
in his birth in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse five, I have come to do your will, O God. He said, I have come to fulfill the law and completely fulfill the law. I have come in the fullness, the volume of the law, the Old Testament. So what he was saying was, I even came and at birth declared that I've come to keep all the law on the cross. I said, it is finished. I have kept every law. Jesus did not break any of them, but he was very free to break anything that had been added to the law that was not found in the word of God. So the word of God says it's okay to eat corn on the Sabbath day if you're walking through a field, but it doesn't say there that you cannot do it and that the law had been superseded by what the Pharisees had done. They considered their additions even equal to the word of God. I was talking, I was in college and one of the guys in it, we were uh, down the hall from each other. We all met at night and we'd all meet out in the center part of it, you know, and drink coffee and, and Cokes and talk about things. Anyway, this one guy said, I understand that your dad's a preacher. I said, well, he isn't anymore, but he was a preacher. Yes, he had a church. So what kind of, he started talking about it. He said, what kind of things do they have in there? So I began to talk to him and he said, oh, we couldn't do that. I said, it's in the Bible. He said, well, what happens is he says, in my denomination through the centuries, they have added things to it. And we consider that to be equal with the Bible. Man, my, I mean, the hair stood up on the back of my head. You can't, and this, listen, this is what the Pharisees did. They added to it. And what their additions were, they simply said was because we've done it and added to it that it's equal to the word of God. We stand right up there with Moses. We stand right up there with the prophets by adding to it. Galatians chapter one, verses 13 and 14, Paul calls his Jewish background, religion and tradition. The Old Testament does say that a person can harvest on the Sabbath day, but any who was hungry was allowed to pick corn and eat showbread. In fact, when it hung over the fence and people were walking by a fence, they could reach up and grab anything because it was considered public property. So again, the priests in the Old Testament were unmerciful toward the sick. Luke chapter three, verses 11 through 17, the Lord declares this. The Jews said that the Sabbath superseded people's needs. That is not true. The law again was made for people, not people made for the Sabbath. The Jews said the Sabbath superseded people's needs and religion is more interested in rules, in regulations and laws than in people. In other words, they come to take the law and cut people to pieces with it and make you obey the law. Here's the point. Jesus came with love toward people and a despising of anything else outside of that. If the word of God was there, the word of God is to be obeyed in love. Love is the fulfilling of the law. And so whatever's written there, whenever a person's individual needs superseded that, the moment God would allow that. So again, religion is more interested in rules, regulations, and laws than people. And God does not make people for the law. He makes the law for people. Mark 2, 27, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So it comes back to it again. Religious people love themselves. They love their family. They love their possessions, but not others. And Jesus came to love everyone and put the law underneath the greatest law of all, and that is the law of love. And we come back after this, we'll talk some more about this area of love and simply wanting you to understand, does God send you out to cast out devils? Yes. Does he put you out there to help stop sin? Yes. But most of all, he sent you out there to love people. Love sent Jesus to the cross and love should send you out there to witness to the law. See you right after the break. How much faith do I need to be healed? In The Grace of Healing, Bob Yandian answers this question and reveals the missing ingredient to the healing you've been praying for, grace. Throughout church history, the doctrines of grace and faith have been taken to separate extremes as they relate to healing. The result is that many believers struggle to receive healing from God. Those on the side of grace deny the need for faith, believing that God only heals a select few. For those who only see a need for faith, the pursuit of healing becomes a legalistic struggle to change God's mind. Pastor Bob takes a different approach with practical biblical teaching that balances both elements of grace and faith. You'll find the healing you've been waiting for when you find the missing ingredient of grace. To order The Grace of Healing, visit bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. 
You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Again, in Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, Paul called his Jewish background religion and tradition. You know, I came up through a Pentecostal church and it was Pentecostal grace, so we saw a lot of the grace of God. But you know, so around me, and we did have our own particular, I think, things in there that really came against people and, and, and bound people in ways. But you know what, the other Pentecostal churches around me, I saw even worse because we believed in the grace of God and so many churches that I was affiliated with and had friends in, uh, they did not. And so again, we find in Galatians 1, 13 and 14, again, Paul called his background religion and tradition and these two go hand in hand. Again, in the Old Testament, David did break the law of Moses eating the showbread, but was not punished. You know why? He was hungry. His hunger over superseded that. The priests in the New Testament were unmerciful toward the sick. And Luke chapter 13, verses 11 through 17 is only one story of their unmerciful attitude and hatred toward the sick people and putting the law above everything. The Jews said that the Sabbath superseded people's needs and that is not true. Religion is more interested in rules, regulations, and laws than people. And God doesn't make people for the law. Again, the law is made for people. Mark chapter two, verse 27. This is where we left off when we came to the break. Religious people love themselves. They love their family, they love their possessions, but they don't love others. The Pharisees even put their own oxen above people on the Sabbath day, Luke 14 and verse five, and Jesus really got angry at them for loving animals more than they love people. Sounds a lot like uh, you know what we have today with liberalism, and liberalism always puts animals above people on this planet when God has put people here. He didn't die for animals. Animals are wonderful, you know, and your pets are wonderful, but you know, Jesus didn't die for them, he died for people. And again, then putting the oxen above the people is in Luke chapter 14 and verse five. And so if the eighth day were Saturday, they would circumcise their own sons for health reasons. And you know, she says you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath day and probably everybody else, they would tell you, you can't do this, you can't do this. And so they would put a conflict in there. And Jesus said there's when they have a conflict, there should be no conflict. One supersedes the other. The love for people should always supersede the law. In John chapter 7, verses 23 and 24, go ahead and find that. While you're finding that, again, I want to speak to those who are my dedicated followers and those who are partners with me. And listen, I simply want to say to you, I want you as a partner, not just the ones that are following after me and the ones that are my partners. I'm speaking to everyone else. I would desire for you to be a partner. And again, this is a great group of people, people that are dedicated to the Word of God, dedicated to the message of the Word of God, and the life-changing power of just even one scripture. That's why this broadcast is dedicated to teaching the Word of God. You are students of the Word. I treat you all as students of the Word out there. And I want you to become a student of the Word, not just when I'm teaching here on, on the air. I hope this just, you know, jumps something inside of you. You go, oh, I never saw that. And you, you write that down. It's great to write it down. I do that during sermons. You know what that's for? When this sermon is over, I'm going home and I'm going to look this thing up. You need to do the same thing. When this broadcast is over, start digging into the Word of God. I trust that what I'm developing in you is what I have in me. And I'm passing off to you that hunger for the Word of God. Well, I, there's nothing to do. My wife often says, we can do this afternoon. So I'm going to study. You know, unless she has something to do and she wants me to help her, I'll do that. We'll go do some things. But you know what? Most of the time you can find me in my office studying something and I may never preach on. It's just something I needed to see. And I love that. I love that. And I love to see that in other people. And that's the way those that follow this broadcast are becoming. They are just gluttons for the word of God. And I would like for you to become a partner with me because gluttons for the word of God help to bring great stability to those around them. It's not just my call to see people saved. It's my call to make disciples out of them. And you can't do it without the word of God. Jesus said to those who had just believed in him, he says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciple indeed. You'll know the truth. The truth can make you free. If you'd like to become a partner with me, go to bobbyandian.com. You'll find a place there where you can become a partner with me. And I thank you in advance. Thank you. 
for doing what you're going to do and becoming a partner with me. And I appreciate it so much, but not only me, the kingdom of God appreciates it too. John chapter seven, verses 23 and 24 says, if a man on the Sabbath is circumcised, so the law of Moses is not broken, are you angry at me because I made a man completely whole on the Sabbath? Do you judge by appearance or by righteous judgment? In other words, do you judge by appearance and add and compare that to the law or do you judge by love. Love should be the proper way. And so we don't judge by appearance, by what people are doing or what people are caught up in. We look at them by love. So you use many scriptures as counselors. That's the very thing we started with, your scriptures or counselors. And you'll find that the overarching thing in Jesus' ministry was love for people. But what he meant was a wall of resistance from religion. And they had actually taken the love of God, the word of God, and they had put them off to the side and they preached the word of God as this unflinching standard that you had to live by and even added to it. We find so many cases where they brought out things in Jesus, especially in Matthew 23, choose them out for taking people so far outside the word of God and adding to it. Like you said, the women have to pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin found nowhere in the word of God, except right there where Jesus points it out that you have been made the law such a burden that when they come home from shopping, they have to take their spices and lay them out there and separate 10% of the nutmeg and 10% of the cumin and to take them and separate them and give them to the work of the ministry. And that ministry is you. That ministry is the temple. That ministry is the Pharisees. And so again, Jesus forgave a woman caught in adultery. Man, that would have really frosted them. That have really made them angry to forgive her. Why? She needs to be stoned. And Jesus goes, no, she needs to be forgiven. And then again, he saw her through the eyes of love. This is in John chapter eight, verses three through 11. And this is simply telling it. And I know you're thinking right now, some of you are thinking right now, well, does love contradict the law? No, it actually supersedes it. And this is what Jesus is talking about. Here's the law, here's love. Love belongs on top of it. And if it's a conflict between loving a person and the law, I'm going with loving a person because once they begin to operate in love, then they can begin to obey the law. And they can do it because they do it out of love toward God, not of the unflinching attitude of religious people. So we have authority over Satan and his works. Luke 10, 19, Jesus said to his disciples, behold, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. We have authority. We have power of attorney over Satan and his works. We do not have authority over people. I wish you would understand that. We can't make them do anything. That's love toward them. We appeal to their will. We do not have the right to claim people and make them do what we want. That is religion. The weapons of our warfare are to be used at Satan, not at Christians. Even God does not exercise that kind of authority. The name of Jesus is not some kind of spiritual witchcraft of which we can make people do what we want them to do, and yet we somehow think we can. And people who get wrapped up in themselves, get wrapped up in their authority, usually end up trying to make people do something, and if they won't physically make them do it or convince them to do it, they'll start claiming the name of Jesus and coming against demons and forcing them in their own by their own will to do this, and even God can't do that. God can't make you get saved. He can't make you become a disciple, but he can't can offer all the benefits of it out of love toward you. And then by giving it in love, we then receive it in love and want to become a convert. Then we want to become a disciple for the Lord Jesus Christ. There were many in Jesus' day, adulterers, sinful people, drug addicted, overweight people. I have seen people, boy, I wouldn't go, you know, wouldn't pass too many prayer lines today, but uh, there's ministers and prayer lines and, and literally tell people the reason why you're sick is you're overweight, begin to come. And Jesus never did this. He healed overweight people. He had to, because he healed every body of everything and there had to be some fat people out there. And yet he didn't come against them. What he did was he I simply laid hands on them and commanded the sickness to leave. He did it toward hatred toward the works of the devil, but love toward the person. Jesus healed them all. He was moved with compassion, not moved with the law. 
We often judge people who come for healing. We look at their outward appearance, not through the eyes of love. And so we ask if they're smokers and they have disease to say, well, you gotta quit smoking. Then the disease will be taken care of. And they've sinned or come from some sinful family, have lust problems. John chapter nine and verse two, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Even the disciples were trying to pass blame and look for reasons why people were sick. Jesus knew what the reason was. The reason was Satan. That's why they were sick, and he came to conquer the works of the devil and set people free. Jesus forgave the woman in adultery, then told her to change her life. He didn't tell her to change her life and then come back and we might forgive you. No, he forgave the woman first and then told her go and change her life. But how many people in prayer lines, oh, we're not gonna pray for you, you gotta go change your life, get yourself in order, then come back and maybe we'll pray for you then. How are you different than a Pharisee? You're looking at a person not in love, but Jesus forgave her. And you know what? If she'd have come back and committed adultery again, he would have forgiven her again. Well, how often would he forgive her? Jesus said to his disciples seven times in a day and eventually 490 times is how often you forgive them total. By that time, he simply run out. You don't know how much you've done, so you just keep forgiving people. So again, Jesus didn't tell her to change her life and then come back for forgiveness. Many who come for healing, you know, changed their lives after receiving healing. This is what God wants. He shows compassion first, and then there is action after that. We are saved, and then we change our life, not vice versa. Why do we have to earn our healing? We don't have to earn our salvation, but we often make people have to earn their healing. What can I do for you? Religion seeks people without needs because religion is self-centered. Religion asks, what can you do for me? Jesus asks, what can I do for you? In closing, Matthew chapter 9. Verses 12 through 13 says, when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are whole do not need a physician, but those who are sick. Where do the Pharisees head to? Those that are whole, those that have money, those that are doing okay. They don't know what to do with sick people, people with needs except to condemn them and blame other things on why they are sick and why they're not whole. Jesus just forgave them and loved them. Verse 13 says, but go and learn what this means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. I have not come to call the, the righteous, but sinners to repentance, and basically this, and sick to be healed. Oh, we come back to it again. Jesus is one who operates in compassion, but also gives them the word of God. He operates in compassion toward the person. He operates in authority toward Satan. And he, once you get that down and actually put love above everything, your greatest thing is not to see a devil cast out. Your greatest thing is to see a changed person with a smile on their face saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's the greatest thing of all. Why? Because what Jesus does for a person can be eternal. What Satan does is just temporary, and we are working for an eternal God and working in eternal love. Thanks for been tuning in for these past days. It's been a wonderful set of lessons. I know you've been blessed. I know you've learned something. Be sure and get the book on healing, and I'll see you next time. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.